Good day. My name is Paul Wax. I'm the executive director of the American College of Medical Toxicology. And I'd like to introduce you to our webinar series entitled Medical and Public Health Considerations of COVID-19. Today, I'm delighted to uh, introduce our session, uh, which is going to be on recommendations for improving national nurse preparedness for pandemic response, early lessons from COVID-19. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank our webinar series partners. Next slide. All these webinars are uh, recorded and are posted to the ACMT website. You'll be getting an email notification within two days uh, once they have been posted. The, we the website for previous webinars is at acmt.net forward slash COVID-19 web. And any questions about this series can be sent to us at info at acmt.net. Next slide. Uh, there'll be a, a q a at the end of the webinar uh, we typically get many questions which we greatly appreciate um, in order to put in your questions please place them in the q a box or the chat box you can also for those of you on youtube you can put them into the chat box on youtube next slide please there's no conflicts of interest for any of the speakers next slide I'd like to thank my uh, co-moderator dr ziad kazi who's a board member of the american college of medical toxicology uh, he will be uh, uh, presenting uh, a short uh, presentation following the main talk uh, about a recent outbreak of methanol poisoning in hand sanitizers. Next slide, please. We also today welcome uh, our uh, guest moderator, uh, Jennifer uh, Wilbeck, is the president-elect of the American Academy of Emergency Nurse Practitioners. And we're delighted that uh, she's joined us today and she will help with the moderation of the, of the Q&A. Next slide. At this point, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. It was really uh, my delight to introduce uh, Dr. Tenor uh, goodwin Vinema. Uh, Dr. Vinema is a visiting scholar and professor at the John Hopkins Center for Health Security uh, from the John Hopkins University. Uh, she is a uh, national and international expert in nursing uh, preparedness and has worked many, many years uh, prior to COVID um, on developing preparedness for nursing and other allied health specialties. And she just uh, led the report that she'll discuss about uh, lessons learned. Um, she's also a long-term friend of mine, and I'm really honored to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Binema, who will be talking about recommendations for improving national nurse preparedness for pandemic response, early lessons from COVID-19. Tanner. Thank you so much, Paul, and thanks to ACMT. Uh, it's an honor and privilege to join you all today. And I really want to take the time to thank ACMT for their commitment to providing ongoing situational awareness and educational offerings to healthcare providers throughout the pandemic. It's just really stellar, and I thank you for doing that. Um, I am thrilled to be here today to present this report and just want to take a moment to acknowledge uh, the leadership of Dr. Tom Inglesby and Anita Cicero, who are the directors of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, and all of the, my colleagues there who helped uh, contribute to this report. Um, this national workforce analysis was truly a team effort. And so there were many people at the Center for Health Security who contributed to the analysis of this work and also colleagues at the University of Michigan and the University of New Mexico School of Nursing. So my sincere thanks to them. Um, what I'm going to do today is try to give you really a broad brush overview of what was a very large and comprehensive national workforce analysis to, to try to really look at the issues of nurse preparedness and capacity to respond during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what we have certainly seen without question is that this pandemic has revealed significant insufficiencies and lack of preparedness in the U.S. healthcare system, uh, which, which has tragically related in healthcare worker infections and deaths. Uh, last time I looked at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, we were approaching almost 700 reported healthcare worker deaths as a result of COVID-19. 
And nurses uh, have played and will definitely continue to play a pivotal role uh, in this response. And yet all of the evidence that we have seen is really quite compelling and has revealed a lack of access to adequate personal protective equipment, inadequate knowledge and skills related to overall pandemic response and clinical care of critical patients. We've seen uh, evidence of a lack of decision rights as it relates to nursing's ability to control workflow redesign and staffing decisions and allocation of scarce resources and in certain instances a fundamental disconnect between frontline nurses and the nurse executives and hospital administrators. So we believed uh, very early on that there was a critical and compelling need to identify these gaps and in inadequacies and to try to understand what has contributed to this lack of pandemic readiness, both within and outside of the nursing workforce. Um, and we really also included overall emergency planning and resource procurement and allocation as it related to uh, appropriate levels of PPE and ventilators. So um, in this report, we propose a framework for a, um, basically organizing our analysis that looked at four different levels, uh, government, systems, individual organizations, and individuals. And this was a way that we organize the myriad factors that influence nursing workforce development uh, as, as it relates to preparedness and capacity to respond but also uh, that go on to support and sustain safe clinical practice and functional healthcare and public health systems during a pandemic. So our report sought to answer that question. What are these myriad of factors that influence nursing workforce development and training for and safety and support during pandemic response and what what is amenable to change in order to improve uh, the capacity of our nurses to respond? So who, who, were, who were the nurses that we included in this analysis? Um, there are over 3.8 million registered nurses working in the United States right now, both in civilian and military roles. We include nurses working for the Department of Veterans Affairs and the US Public Health Service Corps. And then of course, there are many retired nurses and also military, or I'm sorry, uh, volunteer nurses who work with either the National Disaster Medical System, the Medical Reserve Corps, or with the National Voluntary Organizations active in uh, disasters. And an example of that would be the American Red Cross. So we really included all of the nurses, including advanced practice nurses working within the United States. And what we know is that uh, nurses play a, a really wide variety of roles with multiple responsibilities during COVID-19. Everything from uh, their ability to support and inform epidemic surveillance and detection, contact tracing, uh, potentially working in point of distribution clinics for screening, testing, and hopefully to distribute vaccines and perhaps other medical countermeasures. Uh, nurses implement prevention and response interventions. They provide direct hospital-based clinical care, educate patients in the public to decrease risk of infection, um, and again, provide leadership across many different types of healthcare organizations. Nurses, in addition, counsel and console community members to allay fear, quell anxiety, and of course, try to get the public to abide by state and local guidelines for the implementation of non-pharmaceutical interventions to reduce transmission of disease. What is really interesting when we looked at the evidence was the number of studies that had really already documented a lack of foundational knowledge around emergency preparedness among nurses. In particular, uh, back in 2018, Spectrum Health had surveyed over 5,000 of its uh, nurses and 78% responded that they really had little or no 
familiar familiar with concepts of public health emergency response or pandemic management. This is very similar to what was uh, reported in an ANA survey that was conducted in April, where we saw that 86% of registered nurses responding to this survey were afraid to go to work. 37% had reported caring for patients without appropriate personal protective equipment and only 11% responded that they felt they had the knowledge to care for COVID-19 patients. So what I'm going to do now over the next series of slides is to look at the categories that we analyzed, give a brief description of what their role is in national nurse preparedness, and then to highlight some of our short-term and long-term recommendations that we are proposing in this report. And I wanna let all of the, part, uh, the attendees know that this report is available if you go to the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security website, go to publications, and you will be able to find the report in full that was released on June 10th. So just to go to the role of the federal government in developing a nursing workforce for pandemics, we recognize that there are multiple federal agencies that have a broad range of responsibilities relevant to nursing practice and public health emergency preparedness and response. And in particular, those agencies under the Department of Health and Human Services include ASPR, the CDC, FEMA, OSHA, and HRSA. What we did was take a look at uh, a collection of national plans and policies, which included the White House National Biodefense Strategy, FEMA's National Response Framework, and the emergency support functions articulated within that framework, the CDC Public Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Capabilities, and several others as it related to the hospital preparedness program and the strategic national stockpile. And what we found is that many of the emergency support functions, particularly ESF 6 and 8, many of the CDC FEP capabilities, and certainly goal three of the national biodefense strategy, which articulates developing and effectively distributing and dispensing medical countermeasures. All of these activities are going to be dependent upon a nursing workforce that has the knowledge, the skills, the abilities, and the willingness to respond. So these are major assumptions that all of our national response plans are built upon. And there really is more clarity that is needed surrounding the very specific roles and responsibilities within these plans nurses will be expected to fulfill. So our recommendations uh, back on this section is certainly that Congress needs to pass emergency legislation to protect healthcare workers as it relates to personal protective equipment. And this is because the CARES Act passed in March addressed personal protective equipment for healthcare workers, but it has yet to be enacted into law and appropriated. We also strongly advocate that Congress, the executive branch, and the private sector need to collaborate to create a system that will track PPE supply chains and to support the equitable distribution of PPE across health systems, organizations, and healthcare disciplines. And this is in response to many reports where nurses were not uh, able to access the same level of PPE as other healthcare providers, even within the same institution. And of course, the reports of having to reuse and extend the use of PPE that was never designed for that purpose. Our long-term recommendations really address the need for HHS to strengthen the hospital preparedness program so that it includes specific language and a focus on protecting nurses. And so the HPP program, uh, which has been funded by HHS for many, many years and has accomplished a lot in helping 
raise the level of emergency preparedness of our hospitals, but really does not speak specifically to those factors that impact the nursing workforce within those hospitals. And we also added a recommendation that HHS takes uh, funds an initiative to examine our existing federal policies and plans to specifically identify, articulate, clarify, and document the roles and responsibilities of nurses. Um, this is particularly salient for me. Back in 2016, my colleagues and I conducted a, another research study, which back then really raised the flag that so many of our national response frameworks and plans were very, uh, very much based on the assumption of a ready and willing and deployable nursing workforce. And we called for this to be done four years ago and it still has not. So we have included that in this report. I want to talk a moment about the role of federal funding, or I should say the lack of federal funding for nurses as it relates to pandemic preparedness and response. We did an analysis of several funding sources as it relates to overall public health emergency preparedness and response and recognize that funding overall for this field has been very sporadic and uneven uh, following 9-11. And actually, when you analyze uh, the CDC's overall funding for last year, only 8% of the funding portfolio was spent on emergency preparedness and response. We looked at NINR's funding uh, and its um, current strategic plan going through 2022 which does not mention emergency preparedness or pandemic response. And when we went back and searched from the beginning, NINR has funded over 2,100 different grants and only 13 of them had anything to do with emergency preparedness. So a huge gap there. And finally, AHRQ, which used to fund emergency preparedness as a, a topic of interest, um, has very few grants available and none of those were specific to nursing. So overall, there is just this huge gap in funding from NIH, uh, AHRQ, CDC, we even look to PCORI and there just really isn't any funding available to support research for pandemic planning in the nursing field or to support the development of nurse scientists to conduct this research. We've looked at uh, several of the rapid funding mechanisms that have been stood up in response to COVID-19, which have created opportunities for some nursing research as it relates to this particular pandemic. But these awards are limited and they will not contribute to building transdisciplinary science or supporting early career investigators. Our recommendations as it relates to federal funding were that first, the American Academy of Nursing, which is the, uh, the organization responsible for national leadership and policy formation for nurses, really should convene an emergency commission to outline key questions on pandemic readiness for nurse scientists to address that the National Institute of Nursing Research should issue a request for key research questions that could be addressed via existing or new grants and would also help inform uh, strategic planning for the organization overall. We are advocating that the CDC should fund a National Center for Disaster Nursing and Public Health Emergency Preparedness. And for many of us who've been in this field for years, you'll remember that the CDC back in 2004 funded 27 centers for public health emergency preparedness and response in schools of public health. They funded the perks and the pearls, as they were called, up through 2013. Centers for public health emergency learning or centers for research. And yet all of those were funded. Uh, within schools of public health, and only four out of all 13 even included nurses 
and participating in those centers. So again, another gap identified in terms of an opportunity for a center for excellence in education policy and research. Um, we also are advocating that the specific federal agencies that I mentioned earlier should integrate emergency preparedness back into these strategic plans. I want to talk for a moment about the role of accrediting bodies in healthcare and their responsibility for supporting the nursing workforce by promoting safety and quality of nursing care, promoting safe work environments, increasing professionalism, and diversifying the workforce. And you will find this language in most of the policies and plans that are published on the websites of the accrediting bodies. And yet when you go to look for whether these regulations really do include specific nursing uh, references or whether they mandate or measure nurse pandemic preparedness, we find that they're glaringly absent. And so even the Center for Medicaid and Medicare um, emergency preparedness rule, which was passed back in the fall of 2017 and has been amended recently to include emerging infectious diseases as part of the all hazards approach to preparedness, it still does not specify metrics for me uh, measuring nurse pandemic preparedness or any initiatives to ensure that nurses are provided the education, training, and support they need for pandemic response. Similar to the Joint Commission's requirements, uh, there's an absence of nurse-specific uh, metrics as well. And then finally, just to note uh, that the licensure certification and scope of practice regulations for nurses and advanced practice nurses during emergencies vary state by state. And this has been an interesting case study for those of us who look very carefully at issues of license and certification and their impact on scope of practice as state many states have responded very quickly uh, to provide uh, extensions or alterations uh, in some of their uh, scope of practice laws where others have chosen not to. So our recommendations for the accrediting bodies are short term that healthcare accreditors should implement metrics within their regulations that measure facility readiness specifically for pandemics, that state legislators should adopt legislation that will remove regulatory variability around nurse licensure, certainly during times of catastrophic large-scale public health emergencies. And for more long-term recommendations, we have stated that healthcare accreditors should include education and training of nurses for pandemics as a very specific requirement for continued accreditation. We are also stating that healthcare are proposing that healthcare accreditors should promote public health emergency preparedness and response as a core component of nurse education. I'm going to talk now for a few minutes about the role of institutes of higher education, so schools of nursing and universities that provide uh, education for pre-licensure or graduate nurses. So they are responsible for ensuring that graduates possess the knowledge, skills, and abilities to provide safe, high-quality care. But this really does need to include pandemic response. And yet multiple studies that have been done looking at schools of nursing and their core curriculum, we find that emergency preparedness is not included as part of core curriculum. At best, uh, nurses may get an hour about pandemic influenza or disaster response as part of their public health uh, rotations but that it really uh, is not a part of the core curriculum and this needs to change. The American Association of Colleges of Nursing, which is 
Uh, the voice of academic nursing and has almost 900 member schools is very committed to providing leadership and guidance on content uh, development. And of course, they publish what is known as the essentials documents, which guide um, both pre-licensure and graduate education uh, in schools of nursing. The essentials document is currently under revision at this time. And uh, I have had the great pleasure of working with my wonderful colleagues at AACN to be able to include um, some core competencies and content on public health emergency preparedness and response that will be included in the new revised essentials documents that will be released later this year. And then one other thing that we've seen that really has been extraordinarily problematic, and this goes for medical students as well as nursing students, and that's the impact that COVID-19 pandemic has had on clinical placements. We have had to obviously, out of uh, the desire to uh, put the health and well-being and safety of our students above anything else, pull students out of clinical placements and look to alternatives such as simulation and virtual learning to take the place of being in the clinical setting. This has proven to be a huge burden for schools of nursing, particularly those that are smaller schools and less well-resourced who may not have had uh, a, a, a large simulation lab or had had a really strong presence in online learning and virtual resources. They have had to adapt very quickly and pulling uh, students out of clinical placements has for many of them delayed their academic progression and even delayed their graduation and entry into the workforce. Our recommendations back to institutes of higher education include proposing that all schools of nursing develop and implement metrics for evaluating nurse preparedness so that when nurses graduate, that there is a certain level of competency in public health preparedness and response for pandemics that they have already mastered. We are encouraging state boards of nursing to establish requirements for continuing education on public health emergency preparedness and response. And also that schools of nursing look now to develop uh, more robust and redundant plans for continuing clinical education during these emergencies so as not to interrupt the development of our future workforce. Long-term recommendations, I've already mentioned that AACN uh, is actually already acting to revise their essentials documents and we're, we're thrilled about that. Um, and that accrediting bodies need to require this inclusion of the public health emergency preparedness and response content. And those accrediting bodies are those uh, that accredit schools of nursing. So uh, CCNE and NLN um, accredit schools of nursing and they insist uh, and see evidence that schools have incorporated this account uh, content. We are also strongly encouraging schools of nursing uh, to once again, many years ago, several several of the schools that I worked at and my colleagues did offered a, cer a certificate, whether it's a postgraduate certificate uh, or some other type of certificate in public health emergency preparedness and response that the new nurse graduate could take with he or she into the workplace. Uh, and it would be a, a recognition of, of work that they had done. I want to talk about the roles of hospitals, healthcare organizations, and public health organizations, and the responsibilities that they have in creating environments that are both psychologically and physically safe for nurses to practice during a pandemic. We have seen evidence of nurse staffing shortages and certainly uh, a real challenge to surge capacity early on in the pandemic in the greater New York, New Jersey area. And of course, now we are watching quite closely the spike in COVID cases in Arizona, Texas, South Carolina, and Florida. Um, I refer back to that ANA COVID-19 survey 
that was conducted uh, back in April, where 64% of the nurses reported working short staffed, 33% reported surge staffing as a very urgent need. And we are starting to hear that this is going to be a problem again. Um, I've heard that for North Carolina and South Carolina as nurses, uh, but also unit clerks, environmental services staff, help these uh, healthcare providers and direct support service staff who witnessed what happened in March and April are now calling in sick or fearful in workforce while the spikes are happening across the Sunbelt states. So the role of hospitals and other healthcare organizations is that they should be demonstrating a real commitment to emergency preparedness and response. But this needed to happen before the pandemic hit in order to ensure adequate availability of PPE, adequate mental health support resources, and the capacity once we have a vaccine to rapidly vaccinate all healthcare workers within your organizations. I think all of us have seen a, a great variability in the commitment to emergency preparedness and response. And again, the larger academic healthcare centers and the more well-resourced health systems, not so much, but many smaller hospitals, critical access hospitals, rural hospitals, and those hospitals that don't have deep financial pockets, this has been a huge problem for them. Uh, these organizations are also responsible for providing ongoing hospital-based continuing education on the proper donning and doffing of PPE, how to rapidly establish uh, and operate uh, point of distribution clinics, and ongoing education regarding infection prevention and control, which of course during a pandemic is heightened and needs to include advanced disease containment strategies as well. And finally, crisis leadership and decision making has revealed itself to be a problem as nurses were often underrepresented in the C-suite as it related to hospital administration, and so did not have a voice in all of these issues that I've articulated on this slide. We are proposing that hospitals need to develop much more robust and redundant pandemic response plans that speak specifically to their nursing workforce and that they include greater action items to protect and sustain the nursing workforce for the duration of COVID-19. I think all of us know that this isn't going to go away anytime soon, that when and if we have a vaccine is still undetermined and that we may be looking at several more months of a very intense outbreak. We are proposing that the federal government establish and fund a national nurse pandemic response corps. And what we mean by that is not something as an adjunct to NDMS uh, in terms of provision of clinical care, but that the government funds and trains and establishes a cadre of subject matter expert nurses in pandemic response who could be deployed to smaller or less resourced hospitals and public health departments to help provide guidance on policy, on the implementation of non-pharmaceutical interventions, on reorganizing and redesigning workflow and staffing. These nurse response teams would be cadres of subject matter experts that really could fill this gap in many regions of the country or in many public health and healthcare organizations that may not have internally to that organization the expertise that they need. Super users with PPE and guidance in restructuring healthcare services to pr better protect not only patients, but the healthcare workers within that system. Our long-term recommendations are increasing spending to grow and stabilize the nursing workforce. We could uh, talk uh, much more about this, but uh, Peter Burhaus recently issued a paper that uh, suggested uh, quite strongly that there's evidence to show that the growth of nurse practitioner programs, both DMP and master's programs, 
have surged the number of nurse practitioners in the country and are potentially contributing to a shortage of registered nurses working at the bedside in hospitals. So nursing has long struggled with labor stabilization issues. And now in light of the pandemic, the impetus has only grown, st grown stronger to really address that. We are proposing hospitals need to do a better job to include more nurses in drills and exercises. Very often it's uh, very committed emergency nurses who often participate in the disaster and pandemic drills, but these need to be broadened to cover a greater percentage of the nursing workforce and also that hospitals establish and maintain uh, and support crisis leadership skills in their nurse administrators, nurse executives, and right down to their unit nurse managers. I'm gonna touch base on the role of voluntary organizations and having been affiliated with the American Red Cross for over 35 years, I think I can speak very specifically uh, to some of the challenges for organizations such as the American Red Cross or Catholic Family Charities and others. So these are absolutely wonderful, mission-driven, donor-funded, volunteer-supported organizations uh, that have over and over uh, responded to natural disasters, um, not, uh, you know, airplane uh, disasters and many, many types of events. This pandemic has provided to be a very unique uh, and particularly challenging event, however, for them. So at baseline, these organizations may lack adequate financial uh, resources or human resources needed to support pandemic response. And very often they draw predominantly on either retired nurses who have been out of the workforce or older nurses who may still be in the workforce, but uh, have you know, limitations in terms of their ability to deploy uh, for long periods of time. And also because of their age and perhaps underlying uh, clinical chronic conditions or comorbidities may actually be at increased risk during pandemics. Our recommendations to these voluntary organizations is that they in, con conduct an immediate needs assessment, certainly for PPE and infection prevention and control measures for all of their volunteers in order to protect their staff, um, that they establish pandemic staffing policies uh, very specific to nurses and very broad in terms of uh, leadership, chain of command, roles and responsibilities and protections, um, and that they have the capacity to provide rapid COVID-19 testing for all volunteers. We also uh, are proposing that um, in the long term, that all of these organizations, all of the, uh, and VOADs as they're referred to, the National Voluntary Organizations and Disasters, and this would extend to the Medical Reserve Corps as well, uh, which does a great job, but we want to make sure that there is regular preparedness and response training for pandemics for all of us. So when we look at the role of our own professional nursing organizations, we really haven't seen a great deal of attention to disaster preparedness or pandemic response. Back in, I think it was 2009, ANA convened a quadrennial policy disaster, but certainly there's a lot of opportunity for all of us to work together now uh, and to bring together our nursing organizations, which they have already started to do, to unite around a collective mission to advance nursing emergency preparedness and response. And of course, part of the reason that we've produced this report is to support those initiatives and hopefully extend them and the action uh, that we're calling for in terms of practice and policy changes. Our final recommendation in our report was to ask that the National Academy of Medicine, 
and perhaps in conjunction with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which of course is currently working on a consensus study looking at the future of nursing through 2030, that they would be ideally suited to convene a national workshop, hopefully either this year or in early 2021, to do a greater exploration of these lessons that we've learned from COVID-19 and to be able to uh, really further explore and advance some of these recommendations to strengthen the workforce both now as it relates to our capacity to respond and keep nurses and advanced practice nurses safe during COVID-19, but also looking forward to future pandemics and emerging infectious diseases. So on that note, I'm going to pause and again, uh, before before I turn it over uh, to uh, Dr. Kazi uh, for the next um, the next update on the methanol poisoning, again, I just really have to thank ACMT for this opportunity to speak with you today and to discuss uh, the give you an overview of our findings and recommendations. And I do encourage you all to take the report and use it as evidence to help support change within your own organization. Thank you so much. Ziad? Thank you so much, Dr. Tenner. Uh, it was really uh, a very uh, informative uh, update. I've learned so much from you over the past couple of years working together on emergency preparedness issues and uh, certainly appreciate you giving uh, uh, giving this update to our, uh, to our audience today. Uh, moving on with a brief update uh, regarding the uh, recent um, clusters of illness from methanol toxicity. I have Dr. Michelle Ruha from uh, Arizona. Dr. Michelle Ruha is the current president of the American College of Medical Toxicology. She's also the prof a professor and chair of the Department of Toxicology at Banner uh, University Medical Center. And Dr. Ruha has actually cared for some of these uh, patients and is uh, kind enough to uh, provide this update on a short notice. We will have a, a more detailed update on July 8th with colleagues from um, New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, during our uh, weekly webinar series. Dr. Ruha? Hi, thanks, Ziad. And thank you, Dr. Vanima, for that really important talk. Um, well, I do want to clarify first that um, we have not made a definite association between these hand sanitizers and the cases I'm going to describe, although it seems very likely to me. Uh, we in Arizona, about two weeks ago, started getting called about uh, some methanol toxicity cases. The first case I became aware of um, came in as a call to our poison center requesting transfer to our toxicology service at Banner University Medical Center for a man who had been found down uh, unconscious with bottles of hand sanitizer around him, uh, which is not very unusual uh, as probably everyone on this call knows that sometimes when people you know, are looking for sources of alcohol, they drink hand sanitizer. What was unusual was that his initi initial pH um, presentation to the emergency department was 6.8. So we don't typically see severe acidosis from hand sanitizer. So I think the initial presumption was that he probably may have drank the hand sanitizer, but he probably also, you know, had access to ethylene glycol or methanol and drank, you know, drank something else. So he was transferred to our center. Uh, where he, uh, you know, underwent dialysis and uh, he was blocked with femepazole and uh, testing actually revealed methanol, which was surprising because we tend to see more ethylene glycol in Arizona than methanol. And um, during this time, Dr. Brooks, our poison center director, connected with the poison center uh, directors in Tucson, and it turned out that a bunch of these calls were coming in. And to date, as of today, I believe we have about 14 cases of methanol poisoning. Just a few days after the patient that we took care of, um, we were asked to accept another um, patient who had presented to an emergency department, also acidotic, also with bottles of hand sanitizer nearby, that it appeared that he had drank them and his methanol level actually came back at 530. Uh, we were unable to accept into to our service because of the bed shortages we're experiencing due to COVID. Um, 
And uh, I also understand there's another patient that presented just within the last few days also with pH of like 6.6 .6 at presentation or 6.7. So we've had some patients that are really um, have severe acidosis. Uh, I do not know the status of all 14 that have um, presented. Also, um, our patients, uh, you know, the ones I'm aware of have had some of the typical uh, clinical courses with methanol poisoning, like uh, one patient had basal ganglia in, infarcts on MRI, which happens with methanol sometimes. And the ultimate outcomes of all of the patients have yet to be determined. Um, it's not clear that everyone is going to survive right now. Um, so I actually, we weren't aware of the, the FDA warning when these cases first started coming in. So when I saw the FDA um, advisory about the nine hand sanitizers, it sort of clicked that that was actually the source. Uh, in the meantime, Dr. Brooks, our poison center director, has worked with Tucson's poison center to notify the public health departments in, in the various counties involved and the state health department. And um, I presume that an investigation is ongoing, but like I said, I don't have any conclusive evidence that these brands of hand sanitizer that were warned about uh, or what the patients actually ingested, it only seems to make sense to me. Thank you, Dr. Ruha. Uh, uh, to our audience, stay tuned for an update on July 8th. And uh, we'll hear some more from Arizona and hopefully New Mexico, as well as in a, about Arizona's COVID-19 uh, uh, situation. I'll turn it over to Dr. Uh, Jennifer Wilbeck to moderate the Q&A. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Venema. We have appreciated the conversation. You probably cannot see or may not have had a chance in the comments to see the support for your recommendations and the information that you have shared. There were several comments um, and questions regarding the financial burden on preparing nurses um, for this type of pandemic practice. One of the questions um, was specific to the metrics um, and also to the accrediting bodies that you mentioned. Let's start there. One of the questions was, can you provide an example of metrics that could be used by accrediting bodies to measure an adequate pandemic preparation? Well, that's an excellent question. And I know uh, I, what I can say a couple of things response to that. The Center for Health Security has looked at hospital preparedness and metrics for evaluating that uh, and have the extensive history in that and have published a number of reports that uh, provide some guidance in terms of what you're asking for. There has been a real absence of looking at nurse specific and nurse sensitive indicators for measuring preparedness or even defining uh, readiness, let's say. We certainly can look at clinical competencies and testing those, um, but overall, nursing's contribution to the operations and logistics of hospitals functioning during a pandemic response is something that I know we're still working on. And actually, the Department of Defense is equally interested in these questions of you know, what metrics do we use for evaluating preparedness, evaluating healthcare worker readiness and capacity to respond? I think if it was an easy question to answer, there would be multiple, um, you know, list of, of metrics out there. But I would say, um, please, again, I direct you back to the Center for Health Security and some of the published reports on uh, health systems, um, you know, it's a, a building resilience within healthcare systems and also on hospital emergency preparedness and the metrics there. And then the nurse specific ones, I would say stay tuned. We're working on that and hoping uh, to have more reported on that soon. And just so the um, attendees are aware, if you haven't seen it in the chat box, then everyone should be able to see the specific link to the report that um, Dr. Vienema was presenting um, at Hopkins for Health Security that she just mentioned. That link is posted there for everyone. 
So you mentioned in your presentation um, the funding um, difficulties for planning um, pandemic as well as educational preparation and some of the costs that are associated with training. One of the um, comments that was posted would have you seen any research or has there been talk uh, regarding the role of online um, education to provide nurses? Um, that preparation or podcast, any specific ideas or suggestions for that type of learning? Uh, sure. Um, there, actually, a number, a number of the nursing organizations have developed short, uh, sort of um, kind of a Coursera course approach to online, uh, where it's a very short uh, course that can be taken. I know I worked with the National Council on State Boards of Nursing to write their nursing for COVID-19 uh, response course, and that resource is available on their website. I think that what COVID-19 has done for academic nursing is to really shine a spotlight on an area that we must address going forward. And that is really looking at not only uh, this particular pandemic and the knowledge and skills that must be incorporated or threaded through um, our academic programs in schools, but also in lifelong learning in our hospitals. But, you know, this is not the last pandemic we're going to experience. There will be other emerging infectious disease. We have other hazards. Uh, that exists that threaten health. We have climate change and its impact, uh, the potential for a catastrophic biological event and another one or a radiation event. We really, I think, need to at this point, um, that disaster and public health emergency content can no longer be thought of the, of the well, that would make an interesting elective or that would be nice if we had time in the curriculum or maybe we'll offer an hour once a year as a CEU you know, offering in our hospitals. I mean, this is becoming uh, integral to our daily life on this planet and for the entire nursing workforce to be healthy, to be safe, to continue to come to work, to care for patients, to care for communities. Uh, I really believe that it's time for a massive shift in our education and training programs in order to address these issues. It seems that the attendees are agreeing with you because the questions are um, blowing up on the chat and many of them are surrounding educational um, topics. There was one, um, Dr. Minima, I wanted to go backwards. When you began your presentation, you spoke about the infection rates among healthcare workers. Um, there were several questions initially regarding that. One question was how many healthcare workers had tested positive for COVID and specifically what those numbers that you were speaking of at the beginning of your presentation, who, um, who was included or represented in those numbers reported? Specifically, the question was were federal and private sectors included in that? And then another question was, were long-term care health care workers included? So could well, you speak to that sample? I sure can. And that's those are about five different questions, but each and <laughs> one of them are actually super important and excellent. And I thank our participants for raising them. Let me start off by saying two things. We do not have an exact handle on how many healthcare workers in the United States have been um, exposed, confirmed, um, you know, ha have come down with uh, COVID-19 as a confirmed case and an exact number of how many deaths of healthcare workers. The, the data that I cited to you can be found on the CDC webpage because they, co they collect the data that is voluntarily reported from states. That being said, there is huge problems with the data and we believe it to be an under representation of what is actually happening. There is delays in the data. There is variability in the way different states collect the data. 
Uh, we all know the problems with testing across the United States and uh, you know limitations in adequate numbers of testing, problems with early tests, you know, in terms of sensitivity and specificity. So this is a very important question. And what is truly upsetting is that we don't have uh, the inter interoperability of data collection systems to be able to answer this very important question in a direct manner. So um, I, I would say in order to try to keep up with uh, the CDC's, um, go to the CDC to look for this data. Uh, when I, we looked, when we originally wrote this report, and we looked at the CDC data and we reported, I believe there were approximately 300 deaths at that point um, at the beginning of writing it. But that was based on state reported data of their total deaths and not everybody identified whether or not they were a healthcare provider when they were extracting that data from the electronic health records. So anyway, my, uh, you know, the genesis of, of this whole thing is that we have extensive uh, antiquated data, public health data collection systems in this country. And so we unfortunately don't have a specific answer to that question, but it was a great question. I also want to address this issue of infection control practices, hand hygiene, PPE, appropriate cleaning and disinfecting of equipment. We have marvelous infection control nurses uh, who are educators and practitioners who have been teaching this information, establishing policies related to infection control, and really promoting the importance of all of these topics uh, across the healthcare workforce. We have seen gaps in infection control over the past couple of years where um, people just aren't as attentive as they should be or that we would expect them to be. And I think the pandemic has blown open some of those glaring weaknesses in infection control policies and not policies, but in the actual implementation and practice. <laughs> and then we may have some nurses and advanced practice nurses who have expertise in infection control and disease containment strategies or in the use of PPE, but the majority of the workforce does not. And so that's that's that section that we need to help and bring up and support and sustain to keep those nurses and their patients safe. Fantastic. Um, one of the other um, topics that we saw within the educational realm um, was that about interdisciplinary learning. And given the audience here, I'm wondering if you have seen any examples of pandemic response being taught within an interdisciplinary setting. Have you come across that? You know, at Hawkins, we were fortunate uh, to have a number of initiatives that look at. Um, you know, uh, interprofessional education. Um, certainly there isn't enough out there. Uh, again, you have to applaud ACMT for their amazing leadership and in including nurses and nurse practitioners and uh, other types of advanced practice nurses, clinical nurse specialists. You know, I've worked with my wonderful ACMT colleagues for years, for 20 years now in, you know, the emergency department, in research, in um, policy development. And I think, again, this is a wonderful opportunity that we have uh, to reach out and to uh, cross organizations and cross disciplines to provide more of this information together. I am predicting that there will be better funding, uh, hopefully, you know, for some training grants, uh, HRSA support of uh, additional funding for nurses, and then funding, you know, uh, I know um, I, I've talked with AAMC and AACN about ways that we can work together with nursing students and medical students uh, to again, increase education and training opportunities uh, in an interprofessional manner for all of our students so that we grow a healthy workforce that is able to function during these catastrophic events 
as high performing healthcare teams. Dr. Vienemann, thank you so much for your time and for these answers. I um, apologize that we can't get through to all of these. I'm told that the questions that were not answered will be collated and provided uh, responses on the um, on the website. So if your question was not answered, then uh, we would simply direct you to the website. Thank you again. Thank you so much. It was great to be with you all today and stay safe and stay well. Turn it over to Wax, please. Yes, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think, uh, Dr. Zia, there's one question about methanol that came up. Um, I guess if Dr. Rua is still on the call, uh, do we suspect that methanol uh, poisonings were uh, from ingestion only? And, and is there any potential possibility of having uh, dermal absorption to an extent uh, causing uh, severe methanol poisoning? Um, yeah, I mean, our suspicion is that they were from ingestion only. Um, however, I, you know, I, I think you probably could absorb methanol through these hand sanitizers dermally, um, but I'm not aware of any cases where we had concerns of poisoning from dermal exposure. These were, um, as far as I know, and like I said, I don't have all the details of all 14 cases, but as far as I know, these were all people with um, in likely ingestion of the pro the products for um, the alcohol content. Uh, thank you, uh, and you know, thanks again for uh, uh, reporting on on something as uh, recent as, as this methanol outbreak, which is obviously of great uh, public health concern. Um, so I'd like to uh, thank uh, again our um, our guest uh, moderators. Um, and uh, the uh, Jennifer Wilbeck, as well as uh, Dr. Vienema, Dr. Rua, and Dr. Uh, Ziad uh, for their participation today. Uh, next slide. Um, again, the webinars are recorded. They'll be up on the website. Today's webinar will be uh, up on the website as well. When you get the email regarding the website posting, uh, there's a, a two-question survey. Uh, feel free to uh, provide some uh, answers, basically uh, what future topics uh, might you be interested in hearing from and uh, any additional feedback. We really welcome the, the heterogeneity of the audience. This has been very endearing to us and, and it really encouraged us to continue this uh, on on a, a weekly basis uh, as we bring uh, further topics uh, to, to the audience. Next slide. Uh, next week, uh, we're going to take a break. It's uh, July 4th uh, later on in the week, and, and so we will not uh, be having a webinar next Wednesday. Uh, but we will continue the webinar series uh, on a weekly basis throughout July. Uh, and, the, and the first webinar there is on something that's it's so clearly on, on the tip of all of our tongues in terms of wanting to learn more information about, and it's about uh, vaccine development and vaccine strategy. Uh, so that will start off our webinar series uh, on July 8th at uh, 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Daylight Time. Again, thank you very much to all the presenters and have a good day.